Good, good morning. Welcome and thank you. Thank you for joining us. My name is Carl Mercer and I'm the communications focal point for the President of the General Assembly. Uh, we very much appreciate the chance to be here. Uh, allow me to introduce him. This is His Excellen Excellency Dennis Francis, the President of the General Assembly for the 78th session. Mr. Francis will give five minutes of opening remarks and then take questions and answers. Is it on? Use this one. It's on. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Allow me to state up front that I am very honored to be here with you. And I would like to use this opportunity to commend the government and partner governments of the Pacific Islands Forum in evaluating this critical, in elevating this critical matter of sea level rise for the attention of the international community, whose support and intervention is absolutely necessary to address the dire issues of climate change impacts. You may have heard that I am the first president of the General Assembly of the United Nations to participate in the Pacific Island Forum. And you may ask, why now? My answer to that would be, why not? The United Nations General Assembly is the world's most inclusive, deliberative, most democratic body for dialogue and diplomacy and for problem solving. Its members include 193 member states, one country, one seat, one vote. Small island developing states comprise nearly 40 member states of the United Nations. And the Pacific Islands make up a sizable group within island nations. They are as deserving, as important, as warrant they are as deserving, as important, as warranting of support and engagement as any other member state. And I say both as President of the General Assembly, whose responsibility it is to represent all the member states, as well as a small islander myself from Trinidad and Tobago. But whether it is out of my own sense of responsibility as an islander, or as a result of my role, the conclusion is the same. We have to work together to unify our positions in order to address the challenges we face. And right here in the Pacific, for islands that are small, under-resourced, remote, and highly vulnerable, the challenges are first and foremost climate change and sea level rise. They are, to be clear, existential threatening your homes, your homelands, your heritage, your culture, your livelihoods, and your communities. And I refuse to be a bystander to the disappearance and loss of such profound history and heritage, or to the hardship and pain of people forced by necessity to abandon their native homeland rendered uninhabitable by rising sea level. The General Assembly, the General Assembly of the United The General Assembly of the United Nations as a whole must act decisively to support small island states in meeting, as best they can, these daunting challenges. This includes helping to address the immediate threats through adaptation and resilience building. It includes, for example, helping to ensure that resources are available to communities to respond quickly and flexibly to disasters and or climate-related events that destroy or damage sensitive and or necessary infrastructure and facilities. It includes working to protect for posterity the rich and diverse tapestries of culture and heritage built by island communities over several generations. And it includes removing any doubt or uncertainty that exists politically 
about the statehood, sovereignty, and accompanying rights, including the maritime zones that impacted countries have, as well as about the long-term status of their membership of the United Nations. The message that I've brought with me is that I'm working with small islands to address these issues and I'm championing them at the United Nations General Assembly in New York. I hope to leave with a robust show of support and clear guidance from the leaders in the region about how the United Nations General Assembly can effectively address these burning issues. It is my intention to carry those messages and that advocacy with me to COP28 to the fourth international conference of small island developing states which will take place in Antigua and Barbuda in the Caribbean in May 2024. The hope is that the result will be that the result will deliver constructive, decisive and meaningful change for small island states. They need it urgently. With that I will turn over to you and take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Oh, okay. We'll try our best. Um, so we'll take questions, possibly two at a time. Um, allow me first also to introduce former President of Costa Rica, President Carlos Alvarado, who is here joining the PGA. Um, now, in terms of questions, uh, could you please state your name and your affiliation as well, please? Please, ma'am. Thank you. My name is uh, Gina. I'm from the Solar Alliance. Um, I remember our friend who started doing this PGA. He was very critical of the countries like Pacific way of track and achieving the 2020 goals. Uh, are you also going to discuss about the 2013 goals as well? Apart from climate change, how uh, do we propose moving forward to addressing the sustainable development goals? As I understand, there were some criticisms also the way in which we measure uh, the progress of the Pacific Island countries. Uh, some academics were saying that we measure the progress same everywhere, whereas the different countries have different ways in which they measure progress. Two questions. Thank you. Um, well, perhaps we'll take one more, which I'll do go with that mm -hmm. one, sir. Okay. Is there another question as well? Yes, sir. Thanks, Steve, you come from China. Obviously, there are a lot of opportunities to the uh, analysis. We did still need a lot of gas, single gas productions waiting for the Australian government to sign to go ahead. But that was more than 40 years ago already. So what do you think this will impact the current change of sea levels? Or what are the starting from this kind of actions? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't quite pick up the question. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, regarding the question uh, on the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, you asked whether I was going to be discussing the SDGs. You also made reference to the fact that in the Solomon, in the Pacific Island states, the SDGs are off track. Well, let me put it for you in the wider global context. 
The fact of the matter is that globally, the SDGs are way off track. It is not merely in the Pacific Island states. So there should be no thought or idea that the Pacific Island states are failing while others are moving ahead. That is not the case. The, the, the expectation that significant progress would have been made by now, which is the midpoint in the 10 year, in the 15 year um, uh, cycle for the SDGs, that affects all members of the international community. And it's been a consequence, the consequence of a confluence of a number of things. The pandemic, the war in Ukraine, uh, rising uh, volatility in international food prices, um, global food insecurity, uh, supply chain disruptions, and now we have on top of that the situation in Gaza. So it's been a, a, a combination of factors coming together all at the same time that have resulted in uh, uh, a sort of uh, malaise, global malaise, that has undermined progress with respect to the SDGs. The SDGs are still top of the agenda of the United Nations. You would be aware that in September of this year, the Secretary General hosted the SDG summit, where leaders recommitted to the SDGs. In fact, many of them have come forward with commitments, financial commitments, because what is required uh, is something referred to as the means of implementation the financial resources needed to turbocharge the SDGs. That remains a priority of the United Nations. We are working hard on it because it is a commitment that the UN gave to the international uh, uh, community to address issues such as poverty, hunger, the, the lack of access to proper education, healthcare, etc. In fact, we, um, we adopted three or four very important documents and declarations uh, at the SDG summit, three relating to health, one to pandemic preparedness and prevention, one on tuberculosis, and one on universal health care, which is an issue in many parts of the world because many uh, large, uh, in many countries, large proportions of the population do not have access to proper health care. Um, on top of that, we adopted the SDG de declaration, which recommitted the UN in partnership with the international community to get the SDGs done. Um, on the question of um, the effect of the policy of some countries in this region with respect to the use of uh, long-term commitments for the use of hydrocarbon uh, 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 resources uh, in energy production. Um, the findings of the International Panel on Climate Change stand. That is not, it is not for the UN per se to comment on the domestic policy of any government but the independently appointed expert panel on climate change has made it very clear to the entire international community about the risks, the dangers and consequences of not switching from hydrocarbon based energy to greener, safer energy alternatives. And there's a direct link, to, link, as you know, between greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the level of gases, and um, the impacts of climate change. You might notice that I'm wearing a pin that says 1.5 degrees. Uh, some people mistakenly from a distance think it says 15, but if you look closely, you'll see it's 1.5. That is a very important message because it is the demand, the wish, the policy of countries in the Global South, including countries in the Pacific Islands Forum, 
that the level of global warming should be kept to 1.5 degrees beneath pre-industrial levels in order to ensure the safety and sustainability of the planet. Climate change is going to impact, it is already impacting our daily lives in very many ways. I don't have to tell you, you live on an island, you know. You know that you've been having uh, king tides, for example. You know that you've been having sporadic, right now you're in a period of drought. Um, all of these are the impacts, the cumulative impacts of climate change. But what is particularly bothersome and worrying here in the Pacific is sea level rise and what it will mean for the countries in this region because when the sea level rises, much of your land will be submerged, meaning that you cannot, you will not be able. It might, it might not be you, it might be your children or their children. They will not be able to continue to utilize that land in the way it had been traditionally used for hundreds of years. There's going to have to be adaptation. There will likely be migration in order to keep communities together. So this is going to change the way people live, how they live, how they sustain themselves and their families. And in the relocation, inevitably, there will be impl implications for the long-term survival of your culture, your native languages, etc. Okay, the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization has a convention called the Convention on Intangible Cultural Heritage. Things like the spoken word, um, your language, your, your, your style of singing, which we, 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 we were introduced to yesterday in a church service hosted by uh, the Honorable Prime Minister um, of the Cook Islands. All of these things will be at risk. Your heritage, your identity as an independent, sovereign people, you know, the importance of your culture, what makes you unique and special and distinct from other cultures would be at risk of disappearing, all as a consequence of the impacts of climate change. So this is real and it's present and it's happening right now in slow, sometimes imperceptible ways, but sometimes in dramatic ways. And the role of the UN is to make this issue, to elevate the importance of this issue at the international level so that the UN can make decisions to support the efforts of the Pacific Islands Forum in order to cope better, more effectively with the consequences and impacts of sea level rise and climate change. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Take one more question as well while we think with that. Is there another question? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing. I couldn't hear the noise. Yes, yes. Whether the UN is still relevant today? It's a valid question. I won't deny that. But you must bear in mind that the UN does not per se have an existence independent of its members. 
It's the 193 countries, sovereign countries, that exist on the planet who make up the UN. And each of those 193 countries are sovereign. They, are, they have sovereign rights. They make decisions, and they have the power to make decisions in their own interests, individually. What the UN seeks to do is to try to get these countries to collaborate and coordinate and come to a common understanding and approach on the major global issues requiring attention because no single country or region, regardless of how big, how powerful, how wealthy, how well-resourced, how technologically proficient, can solve those problems alone. Problems like, for example, climate change and sea level rise. Problems like the pandemic. Problems like international terrorism. Okay? Now, so that what is taking place in Gaza is not a failure, per se, of the United Nations. Decisions had been made by the two parties at combat in Gaza that have led to the current situation. What the UN has been seeking to do, both the Secretary General and I, independently, have been to insist that the hostilities stop immediately. Because the key thing right now is to save lives on both sides. I think I read a statistic this morning or yesterday that says, I think 11,000 people have died thus far in Gaza, many of them babies. Hundreds of Israelis, soldiers, and civilians have also died. We have insisted as well that Hamas should, must, release all the hostages unconditionally. Because that was a violation of the law. They must release the hostages. And also that the hostilities must stop in order to allow humanitarian aid and support to get into Gaza in order to render assistance, urgent assistance to the people who need it, okay? Now, that is the role of the UN. The UN is there to ensure that people's human rights, their, inter their, their humanitarian rights, their right to life, is upheld and honored by all countries in the UN. And what is taking place in Gaza uh, leaves a lot of room for concern and worry that basic international rules, the rules of war, it might seem strange to you, but war has rules. Even in war, countries have an obligation to protect civilian lives and civilian institutions, such as hospitals, schools, daycare centers, health centers, places like that, places of worship. You're not supposed to attack those places. There are rules. And there is evidence that international humanitarian law is being violated virtually every day in this conflict. It must cease. It must cease. The dehumanization of human beings cannot and must not persist in this world. Because at the end of the day, we all have the same rights. We all have the same human rights. They are universal, they are indivisible, and they are inalienable. They cannot be taken away. They are your birthright. And that's the message of the UN, that the violence and hostility must stop in order to, and a return to some process 
on the basis of which a lasting peace can be built. Violence only creates a cycle that takes us on a race to the bottom. Yes. What I will say is that I don't know the details and the specifics. What I will say is that um, the SDGs is a global agenda for development that has been established by the United Nations in consultation and negotiation with the 193 member states that comprise the UN.